Welcome, 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 everybody, to the A Little Less Fear podcast. I'm your producer and host of the show, Dr. Lino Martinez. This is your motivational podcast of people's incredible journeys. Oh, yeah, let's do this. Welcome back, everybody, to the A Little Less Fear podcast. Today, I would love to welcome Valina Elizabeth Beatty, is an innocence litigator, a law professor, and a former federal prosecutor. Beatty served as the founding director of the West Virginia Innocence Project. She has successfully exonerated wrongfully convicted clients, obtained presidential grants of clemency for drug offenses, and served as an elected board member of the National Innocence Network. Her experiences as a federal prosecutor in Washington, D.C., and as an innocence litigator in Mississippi and West Virginia, shape her research and writing on wrongful convictions, forensic evidence, prosecution, and incarceration. She is the co-editor of the Wrongful Convictions Reader and the author of the award-winning book, Manifesting Justice, Wrongly Convicted Women Reclaim Their Rights. Welcome to the A Little Less Fear podcast, Valina. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Delighted to be here. So you're all the way in Indiana, huh? I'm in California. I am in Indiana. I'm in the heartland. I grew up in Indiana, and then I recently moved back to teach at um, Indiana University. And how's it going over there at Indiana University? It is, you know what? I'm in Bloomington, Indiana, which is a very welcoming town, particularly for queer folks, which I am. Uh, and so it's nice to see that when on the state level, there's a lot of hostility against the LGBTQ plus community. I'm not too familiar with um, with the LGBTQ plus community in Indiana, but I really wasn't aware that it's uh, it's it's tough out there then, huh? Because I'm in California. I mean, there's parts of California that can be a little sketchy, but I mean, for the for the most part, I I guess you could say I feel safe over here. Yeah, and um, I, my uh, wife actually moved to Indiana from San Francisco uh, so that we could be together in the same place. And there's a lot of uh, acceptance and support in California that um, in a lot of places in Indiana, we're just not there yet. But Bloomington is... Really, every year nationally is recognized as a small town in a rural space that is very accepting of queer folks. So that's good. That is that is really good. So was it a culture shock for her going from San Francisco to Indiana? Absolutely. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. Um, and actually, it was a culture shock for me, too, even though I'm originally from Indiana. I just haven't lived here for a while. Uh, so it's a bit of a culture shock for me, too. Awesome. Uh, but I will say on the positive side, uh, part of the culture shock is that um, people are so freaking nice. Like just, you know, people in the grocery store or in the hardware store, or people are just very nice and polite. So there is this Midwestern niceness that uh, is hard to believe. Yeah. <laughs> I've been to a few states where I've, I've I've experienced that where people are a little nice, a little nice, well, a lot nicer than they are out here in LA. And and sometimes I'm like, wait, what's up your sleeve? Why are you so nice? Well, you're actually yes. really just nice. Yes. That's incredible. Right. It's yeah. like, why is this person being yeah. nice to me? Yeah. Why are you being so nice to me? <laughs> oh yeah. man. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. So, hey, Valina, tell us about your journey. You have an incredible, incredible history going on here. How did it all begin? Yeah. So um, I am really in a space right now where I get to litigate on behalf of people who were wrongfully convicted and particularly women and queer people who were wrongfully convicted. Uh, and I get to teach about that because it's not something we wow. talk about that much, that there's a, a lot of folks who are locked up and incarcerated just because of their identity and because of their queer identity. Uh, so it took me a long journey to get to that space, but uh, I'm really proud to be in that space right now, particularly when there's um, so much hostility against the queer community. Uh, and really just these stereotypes that we may have thought were over and dead um, that, you know, uh, 
gay men are groomers, for example, right? Uh, these stereotypes of sexual violence and deception and uh, depravity uh, that, again, I mean, they, they've just been these tropes that have been used against the queer community for a long time. And it seemed like those were fading away and now they're really coming back. Like I just saw that the um, speaker of the house uh, that he at one point had argued that the Roman Empire fell because of homosexuality. Uh, so there's a real ramp up um, against queer people. And I'm a lawyer, I'm a law professor. And so I see that in the courtroom. And I see how that's used against uh, people being targeted, arrested, charged, uh, and wrongfully convicted. Um, I know I'm just talking for a while. Do you want me to share how I got here? Yeah, yeah. but before that, I actually had a question right now while yeah. you're talking about this, because I'm yeah. I'm somewhat feeling the emotions of what it would feel like to walk into a courtroom and hear all these things and being part of the LGBTQIA community. How do you handle the rush of emotions and the protectiveness that comes with all of these things that you hear around you in your face in a place where you have to be professional? Yeah, it's really hard. And it's a question I talk about in my book, Manifesting Justice, which is how much should we, should we pass to help someone else? So uh, I um, often would wear clothing and put on a demeanor uh, that would um, help me pass as straight because I didn't want my identity to negatively impact my client, right? right. So that's like a, a very tough decision. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know that that's the right decision at all. Uh, I mean, I have had clients wrongfully convicted specifically because they are very open about their identity and that could be seen by a jury. And I've had other clients who were advised to pass, right? When they first went to trial, they were advised, well, try to do whatever you can, grow out your hair, or if you're a um, female identified, uh, so it's this really thorny question because you're really diving into these stereotypes and you don't want those stereotypes to be used against someone who's a defendant. On the other hand, if it's just a presumption that there are no queer people, then it right. becomes easier for the queer person to be the other and to be demonized and well, okay, I guess a queer person could commit a horrendous crime because I don't know anyone. And that's not true. Um, so I've really gone back and forth on that issue. I think it's been very powerful, for example, to have um, women of color advocating in the courtroom at the highest levels, even when they're advocating to all white male judges. Right. And how much is their identity being used against them in their advocacy? But how much does it matter also that they didn't just pass the the case on to a white man to litigate in this idea like, oh, uh, the court will be more receptive to them. So there's there's just so much to weigh there. A lot of fear, too. How do you actually yes. step away from here, fear, overcome the fear? And oh, my goodness, the, the accelerated heart rates and the, the sweat. I mean, I could just I could just feel it all. Like, how do you actually breathe yourself into it and know that you're stepping in i mean unselfishly you're really there to protect the rights of so many others by putting yourself first and your own your own well-being first yeah and there's so much to be said from um your own journey and the journey of other people and being authentic to themselves and how that can have ripple effects uh it becomes difficult as a lawyer advocating for another person when, you know, it's not supposed to be about me. It's supposed to be about my client. And um, am I helping or harming the person? But I think right. 
there's real true value to having that authenticity and forcing these uh, closed spaces to um, see people who are different from them and recognize their humanity. And when did you realize that this, you were stepping into a passion of yours? I guess we can start with your journey. How did the, all of this begin? Yeah, this all began uh, when I um, was in college and I was a rape victim advocate uh, and I was also a domestic violence counselor. Uh, and through that experience, being on call for different hospitals around the city of Chicago uh, and going and advocating for uh, these survivors, uh, I wanted to become a prosecutor. I wanted to prosecute people who caused violence and harm. And I thought that that would be a way to end cycles of harm. Um, and I thought that we should lock up those folks. Uh, so now we would call that a, like a carceral feminist. So I went to law school and I got my dream job and I became a prosecutor and I prosecuted domestic violence and sexual violence. Uh, and the answer was not that easy. It was not that easy at all. Uh, and uh, bringing charges, putting people in prison did not stop these cycles of violence. They didn't. Uh, and I often found that survivors wanted nothing to do with me. They wanted nothing to do with the criminal legal system. It was further harming their lives. Uh, and that was a real turning point for me. Um, and it was... It was really through some of my cases as a prosecutor that I started to question what we were doing. Uh, and I learned about people who had been wrongfully convicted of uh, sexual violence. And qu queer people in particular can be susceptible to allegations of sexual violence that um, aren't them or aren't, sadly, uh, aren't substantiated. Um, so I made a shift in my life and I started doing wrongful convictions work and moved down to Mississippi <laughs> and started representing folks who were wrongfully convicted. And I can imagine that at least at working with folks that have been wrong, wrongly convicted now, they actually do feel, you would feel that they, they need you and they acknowledge you rather than not wanting anything to do with you. Yes. Yes, absolutely. In fact, the real turning point for me was meeting uh, an exoneree and meeting someone who had just been freed in Mississippi, uh, LaVon Brooks, and his, um, his mom had fought for him for the 20 years that he had been in prison. And then, wow. yeah, yeah, and never gave up on him. And once he was freed, uh, she died. Oh. And I was just like, you must be so angry. You must be so just angry and devastated. And he was like, she was able to put her hammer down. She didn't have to fight for me anymore. She saw me free. She could rest. Uh, and to have that kind of grace, that is uh, nice. it is. It was, it was transformational for my life. Yeah. I can imagine you had quite a bit of instances where you've experienced cases like that that have kept you currently continuing the journey that you're at, that you're on. Absolutely. I mean, there's uh, a lot of loss in um, people's experiences in the criminal legal system, a lot of loss, losing family, um, losing your own sense of self, um, uh, losing your own dreams, uh, and yet to know people who continue to fight and continue to fight not just for themselves, but for others, uh, keeps, keeps me going as well. And so continuing to fight for others, how have, how has this helped you in your life? Oh my gosh. It's made my heart 10 times as big. Yeah. Oh, I can't uh, How <laughs> yeah. And I've really, um, uh, I've 
learned to have more acceptance uh, and non-judgment of many more people uh, rather than jumping to condemn uh, individuals. Uh, I think that's that's the easy path is allowing our, our anger to take over and to condemn people instead of um, and realizing the humanity and all people. One of the most inspiring things to me is that I have, you know, clients who are wrongfully convicted, should not be in prison, but they are advocating for their uh, sisters and brothers who are incarcerated with them, right? Regardless right. of whether right. they committed the crime or not, they're saying, well, these other folks who are in here with me shouldn't be treated this way either when something happens. And what's the longest trial you've been on? Oh, gosh. Um, I'm representing a woman right now, Tasha Shelby in Mississippi, uh, and she was wrongly convicted in 2000. Uh, and I started representing wow. her in 2010. Whoa. So, yeah. It's been a long journey. A that long is journey. a really long journey. Well, you really keep going. My goodness. You try every way. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I, I mean, again, as a lawyer, you just, you try every single avenue and you're like, okay, well, let's try, let's try this one next. Um, and you just keep trying. Yeah. Could you tell us one of your proudest moments? <laughs> oh, one of my proudest moments. Uh, I would say it was my um, very first time walking someone out of prison because uh, it was it was a first for me. Uh, I even got a tattoo um, that <laughs> says <laughs> it, it says in Braille uh, free. Aww. So I got a tattoo, um, and it was like just finally, finally, finally seeing these individuals free. And that doesn't take away from, uh, you know, the pain and the trauma and right. the loss. It doesn't, but uh, it's a whole new chapter. Mm -hmm. And just being part of that whole new chapter. Um, uh, I mean, one of the things I really, really love about my work is that by... Um, by believing in someone and again, listening to their story and uh, really trusting and believing and supporting them, that brings other people in. So that can bring back in family members who haven't talked to my client in years. That can bring in my students who become interested. Uh, that can bring in community activists. And just from that you know, kind of small seed of listening and believing someone, you just can see a whole community grow. That's pretty neat. That's beautiful, Valina. So is that you bring people together and you, you didn't even know you're, that the, you're, you were going to have this much of an impact. Yeah, no, I didn't even think about that part of it, but it's, it's just a key, key part of all of it. Yeah. So take us back to that moment of your your proudest moment and you're walking out of jail or prison and um, with your client. What is your client? What kind of emotions are they going through at that moment? Uh, well, I'm in the background, right? Yeah. <laughs> like it's mainly about them being it's um, it was my client, Lee Stubbs and her co-defendant, Tammy Vance, who were both wrongly convicted uh, because they are lesbians. Um, for a crime that did not occur. So queer people are more likely to be wrongly convicted where no crime occurred. So uh, no crime occurred and uh, they went to prison for 10 years. But um, but it, like I wasn't, I got to watch essentially. I mean, of course I was like, congratulations, but they were physically being reunited with their family members, right? And just- Incredible all these hugs and all this excitement uh, and Tammy's mom brought the shoes that both of them had been wearing when they went into prison. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and just 
the the joy and then the like let's get out of here <laughs> right, yeah, right. Like, let's, let's like get in our cars and go yeah like, yes <laughs> and then just having like these get-togethers at um at their homes so uh they both had just some get-togethers to have relatives come over and have food and celebrate and welcome the person home it's uh that's really special it really is special i can feel it and i can envision it it looks it looks incredible it looks beautiful i'm so glad you're doing this valina this is amazing thank you <laughs> me too <laughs> so have you ever felt that you wanted to change your careers or do you feel now that you're this is exactly where you're supposed to be so um i often tell my students like you learn from each job you take and you don't have to stay in a job you know like you can take whatever from it and move on and there's no um shame in changing your careers. So I made a big change when I left being a prosecutor. Oh yeah. Uh, but the nice thing about my path now is that it has changed uh in different ways. True. Uh, are evolving. It, yeah. So initially I was just a litigator, just an innocent not I should say just I was only <laughs> an innocent litigator. Uh and then I became um, a professor as well. So I was teaching and I was founding this whole project, uh, the West Virginia Innocence Project. So um, then I was kind of directing this whole initiative. Um, and now I'm in a space where I'm much more on the teaching side. Uh, and I still have some clients and I'm on the board for our Innocence Project of Indiana, but I'm not doing all the administrative um, stuff. Uh, and so like over these 15 years now, uh, <laughs> over that period of time, it's been great to um, kind of shape the work into what was kind of most meaningful to me in that in that time period. Tell us about the West Virginia Innocence Project. Ooh, so I moved to West Virginia to found the West Virginia Innocence Project. Uh, it's uh, directed today by two wonderful people, Melissa Gingenbach and uh, Devin Unger. Uh, and they continue to exonerate people. They continue to advocate for people uh, and uh, particularly marginalized folks in a marginalized state. Uh, and I was, yeah, I was really, really proud of everything we did, but I'm even more proud that it's still going on. That's amazing. And so how, um, what, do, what do you actually do though with the, how did you actually get it started? Okay. So I moved there and, uh, the university, West Virginia University, provided the funding to start the, what was a clinic. So West okay. Virginia Innocence Project was a clinic. Uh, so that meant that there were students who were involved. And with the students, we would um, receive applications of folks from prisons all around West Virginia. Uh, and they would share their stories with us. And we would go to the prisons and meet with them uh, and work on cases. And the really, um, one of the disheartening things is that it's really, really hard to reverse a conviction. Uh, so it's much harder to reverse someone's conviction than for them to get convicted in the first place. Much harder. Uh, so we could only ultimately... Um, represent folks where we really had the concrete evidence to show uh, they did not commit this crime, someone else did, or it wasn't a crime, um, and that we could actually have a chance of their conviction being reversed. And even then, I mean, we've lost a bunch. Um, but uh, I, with the students uh, and some volunteer attorneys, would look into these cases and talk with these individuals and talk with witnesses and then file with the court. 
and see if the court would be willing to have a hearing and hear all of our evidence and consider reversing the conviction. Um, I will say that's not the end of the road because prosecutors will often rebring the charges. So even after your conviction's reversed, that means you get a new trial. So the prosecutor rebrings the charges and then the prosecutor says, well, if you plead guilty to whatever charge, then I'll ask for a sentence of time served, which means you don't have to go back to prison. So that's very uh, tempting for people who have been wrongly convicted. I can see They've that. already been to trial. They've yeah. been in prison for years. And now the prosecutor is like, if you just plead guilty, then you won't have to go back. Um, yeah. So those are tough situations. Really tough situations. What kind of positive shifts have you seen in wrongful conviction since you began this journey? More people know about it. Okay, great. I mean, that's the, the best part is that more people know about it. Uh, that they, they do know that this can happen and that people can be wrongly convicted. Um, that's huge. Uh, particularly, I mean, I think about my clients and they, the ones who are freed get to go back to their communities, but there's often some folks who still think, well, I still think you did it. Um, and I, I think that's changing. I do think there's just much more awareness that our, you know, our criminal legal system is humans and humans make mistakes. Uh, and um, we don't always get it right. Uh, and we should support people when they're coming out of prison. And I think that is a broader shift, too, of just maybe we should be supporting all folks as they come out of prison so that it's less likely they'll go back in. You know? I love that. I love that. Yeah. Absolutely. That opens up the door for a lot more peace, actually. <laughs> Yeah. Regardless of labels. Yeah. And so now you have this book. It's called Manifesting Justice, Wrongly Convicted Women Reclaim Their Rights. What got you to write this book? What inspired you to do this? Well, I have always, since I was a kid, I've been a writer. <laughs> so I, I've always loved to write. Um, but there's a big difference between writing for yourself, which is what I would always do, and yeah. writing a book for the public, right? Yeah. Like, wow, why would I do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to write the book because I felt like I had something to say. Uh, I really felt like it was important to have conversations about wrongful convictions and that people weren't talking about um, women and queer people being wrongfully convicted, that that was just not part of the conversation. So this is the first book to actually talk about um, LGBTQ plus wrongful convictions. Uh, and I think I'm again, you that, are, Belina, by the way, I hadn't heard of such a book until I was reading your profile. I was like, this is incredible. Oh, thank you. I wish more people knew about it. <laughs> well, they will. They are. And they will. Thank you. Um, yeah. And one of the, again, one of the key takeaways is that, um, women and queer people are most likely to be wrongly convicted where no crime occurred. So I'll just explain, you know, what could that even mean? Well, uh, let's say so I'm in Indiana and there yeah. is a woman, Christine Bunch here in Indiana, and she lived in a trailer with her young son. You know, he's four or five years old uh, and a fire starts in their trailer. And tragically, her son dies in the fire. So uh, ultimately, you're able, if you investigate, to find out that it was an electrical fire. Um, I mean, very tragic electrical fire that started. And frankly, um, sadly, a lot of um, mobile homes are more susceptible to fires because of uh, the materials that they're built with. So she loses her son. It's this horrible tragedy. Uh, but the prosecutors and the police think that she set the fire. And so they charge her with arson and they charge her with murder. 
and oh she goodness. yeah and she goes to prison for the murder of her son this is awful for years and there was no murder um there there was no arson uh it was an electrical fire but uh she still went to prison and the the very additionally hard thing about these convictions is when we think of wrongful convictions we often think of dna evidence right yeah. so yeah i can say oh it's not valina it's jen who committed the crime right, right. i got the dna to prove it right um but if there's no crime if there's no true perpetrator uh then it's a lot harder to you know, show the proof that, look, this person didn't commit the crime. You don't have the DNA. You're not going to have the DNA in any of those cases. And how how does someone find? I mean, how do you dig deeper? How do, how do doors open? I mean, what happens? How did, how did this case end? What's going on? Yes, yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so most of my cases are forensic evidence cases. Uh, and forensic evidence um, means... It's essentially uh, evidence that has developed through the police. So shoe prints, right? So police develop shoe prints. Uh, police develop fingerprints. Um, but then it turns into like bite marks, which are totally bogus, totally bogus, and yet still come in. Like, oh, look, this is a bite mark. Um, bite marks are also more likely to be used against queer people as like, oh, I know, I know. It's a, it's, there's a lot of Whoa. weird stuff out there. You know, stereotypes about lesbian vampires and- Are you saying, like, I've never yeah, heard this. I know, right? It's like all this craziness. Again, all these like sad, incorrect, false associations of queer people with violence in different forms. Um, but forensic evidence, so we've got bite marks, we've got fire science, we've got blood spatter, we've got shoe prints. So about 10 years ago, there was finally a national reckoning of these aren't actually that reliable. I mean, they're not that great in terms of pieces yeah. of evidence. But we've been convicting a ton of people based on shoe prints, right? Right. Or based on blood spatter. Yeah. So now we know more. Science has changed. And we're able to go back and challenge some of those convictions. And that's what helped this specific case with the mobile home coming on. Getting this on bunch. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. They were able to actually have someone investigate and find out, oh, here's what the start of the fire was. Yeah. Instead of kind of arson myths, like myths about fire. And so how did how did that woman react when she finally finally felt that she was wrongfully convicted and, and was heard and listened to and acknowledged? Well, she wrote a book. So oh, wow. she so she has a book about All her right. experience, Christine Bunch. Um, but you know, she went to court after court after court that just said, no, we're, you're staying in prison. We're not convinced. Um, we're upholding your conviction uh, for years. I mean, I, I think it was a total of 12 years that she was in prison uh, and just trying again and again and again uh, until finally, finally she was freed. Um, and she still lives in Indiana and she has started a nonprofit that supports other uh, exonerees and wrongfully convicted people. This is excellent. Have you kept in touch with any of your clients, former clients? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Awesome. So the I mean, it's pretty stays. easy. Yeah, it's pretty easy nowadays with like social media and yeah. um, and some of them I'm closer to than others. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. So where do you see yourself like five years from now, or should I say three, three to five years from now? Oh gosh. I always encourage my students to think about that, but <laughs> I don't think about it as much, right? <laughs> um, You're too busy asking the question. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
So I'm I'm actually working on a second book where I've interviewed uh, about 70 different uh, advocates in wrongful convictions work. So Whoa. lawyers, social workers, um, spiritual leaders, exonerees who, like Christine, have supported other exonerees uh, and uh, have been working on kind of gathering together their wisdom and insights uh, for how can we move forward and how can we help more people? Um, and also how can we do this work as a community, as a collective and um, not burn out, you know, not become overwhelmed by, uh, by, by the loss. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a question about the wrongful convictions in and Indiana. Do you see some states being more prone to wrongful convictions as to, as uh, compared to other states? So, uh, I will say states are prone to different wrongful convictions. So, oh, okay. uh, yeah. So Chicago is known as the city of false confessions because for years they had police. Did you say fal false confessions? Okay. Because for years they had police through this, um, this specific unit run by Commissioner Burge who they would abduct, essentially, they would arrest and abduct young black men on the south side of Chicago and take them to unknown locations and torture them uh, to receive confessions and then would convict them on these false confessions. I mean, it's horrific. It's a horrific history. Um, we don't necessarily see that happening in rural communities. But in rural communities, you may be more likely to see really crappy scientific evidence like bite marks come into the courtroom. Um, so they're just different types of wrongful convictions. In cities, you're more likely to see um, mistaken eyewitness IDs oh, where- I can imagine that. Yeah, because um, you're- you're not living in a town of 2,000 people. Right. Yeah. Um, but again, so they're just different wrongful convictions if you're in a rural space or if you're in an urban space. I see that. That's interesting. That's really fascinating too. I never, I've never would have thought that. That's, um, I wonder what it's like out here in, in California. What type of, what's popular out here for wrongful convictions. That's one, it's interesting. Yeah. Well, in LA, I will tell you, there was a scandal about 20 years ago, the Rampart scandal, where it was police who were planting drugs on people. Uh, so those were wrongful convictions. Um, and then also like paying informants to go into the jails and prisons to um, try to get statements from people. So that too, yeah. That's, oh my goodness, so much going on everywhere, all over the world. I can imagine. I know. I, I don't mean to be a downer. There's lots <laughs> of good stuff too. <laughs> Melina, so what do you tell your students when when they are stuck in between whether or not they want to be prosecutors or, or go into the same line that you're currently doing or whether or not they want to be an author? I mean, what do you tell your students when they're kind of confused and not really knowing which direction to go? Yeah, um, do what you're drawn to, really. And also try it out. Yeah. Uh, again, there's there's no harm or shame in trying it out. And if you're drawn to being a public defender or a prosecutor or an author, like try it um, and see if it's a fit for you. We need really good prosecutors, right? Yeah. Like, that's that's really important. We also need good public defenders. Um, and a lot of places where we work, it's about the workplace culture. It is. is it a culture, right? You know, is it a culture that supports you or is it, you know, a beatdown? So, um, yeah, I always encourage students just try different things and just go for it. So what do you enjoy about teaching? Oh, I love that students have this energy and enthusiasm um, and excitement yeah. about uh, 
all of it, right? Like they're right. new to it. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, oh, wow, I didn't know this is possible. Ah. Um, and then they're excited to make a difference and to volunteer and to just become advocates. And um, it, it, there's, it's so fresh. Right. So I mean, fresh. I've been doing this work for a while. And so it yeah. just it feels really fresh and um, inspiring. I, I absolutely love that about teaching as well. I love and sometimes I'm surprised by their questions. I'm like, wow, I I haven't even thought of that. And it seems like every year there's like an evolution of students where they're coming up with new, fresher ideas. And I see the the evolution. That's the only word I can use, really, of their minds and their, I call it their superpowers because everyone's coming in with their own creative juices and it's really starting to create a new flow and opening new doors and which means there's going to be changes coming up for a whole new generation. Right. And the, the adaptability of folks and like yeah. new ideas and they're like, oh yeah, of course. And I'm like, yeah. wow, <laughs> I'm just starting to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fascinating. I love it. Belina Beattie, everybody in her incredible book, Manifesting Justice, Wrongly Convicted Women Reclaim Their Rights. Thank you so much for being on Little Less for your podcast. Is there anything that you want to leave? Any last words for the world? Uh, just that you always got to find the joy. Always got to find it. Absolutely. If you find the joy, you basically find your inner strength and you find authenticity and it's infectious. Joy is infectious indeed. Thank you so much for being on my podcast. I wish you and your family and all of your loved ones, all the joys of the world. And we're, we'll are we keep in touch. Thank you so much, Valina. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Take care. You too. Thank you. Thank you all so much for tuning in to the Dr. Lino Show, a little less fear podcast. If you'd like to get a hold of me, you can do so by sending me an email at a little less fear at gmail.com or through an inquiry from my website at www.alittlelessfear.com, where you will always find information on where to get my book. You can get my book on Amazon and Amazon paperback version, Kindle or Kindle Unlimited. And I also create incredible visual video poetry. For people that are interested in marketing or even just to send a personal note to anybody or somebody that you might love. So yeah, check it out. I love it. Poetry is my passion. One of my other passions, aside from doing what I do right now, which is giving you all the motivation that you need to keep growing, to keep motivating people, motivating yourself, and to keep expanding. I love you all so much. Have a blessed day and take care. Rock on.